Here with me on this episode today is portrait photographer David Hakamaki. David is the owner of Cutting Edge Photography in Iron Mountain, Michigan, a full-time home-based photography business that focuses on high school seniors, youth sports, families, children, promotional and travel, and weddings. He's a regular speaker at photography conferences across the United States and serves on Simply Color Lab's senior dream team and is also one of Kubota Image Tools' champions. So hi David, I'm really excited to have you on here with us today for another great chat about high school senior portraits and running a home-based studio. Hi Nigel, great to be here. Fantastic to have you on here again. We've got a lot to cover today, so let's jump straight in. Our topic for today is marketing high school senior portraits. Oh, one of my favorites. And, and running all that from a home studio. So most schools seem to have a contract studio that takes care of all of the photos for the high school yearbooks. How can the independent photographers compete with those to get more senior portraits business? Well, thankfully, we don't have that in our location, but we, we have to compete with other photographers, the school contracted photographers for sports programs things like that. So what we need to do as photographers when a situation like that arises is we need to make it all about the experience. Those companies can't provide an experience for the high school senior. They just, their assembly line, bang, 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 bang. Uh, there's no experience. So we need to market to them that they're going to have a fantastic experience and they're going to get wonderful images to display on the wall. They're not going to be the yearbook photo that you want to put on the wall. It's going to actually be a beautiful portrait in a location, in your studio, wherever you take it. Right. The contract studios, because they're high volume, really just don't have the time to be able to spend individually with the, the students to create something more sort of personalized or unique for them. And it's, it's up to the independent photographers to offer a better personalized service. Right. Options in posing, options in location, all of that has to tie together to break away from that contract uh, mentality. When it comes down to marketing this stuff, a lot of the photographers that I, I talk to all the time say, how do we market this? How do we get this information out to the seniors and to the, the moms and, and parents? Uh, so what is the most effective marketing tool that you use in your business, for example, to create buzz and some excitement about what you offer? The first thing we use is senior models. We have basically the representatives of my studio in each of the school districts. And what we do is we allow them to be the voice of us. The, the high school senior, they don't care what we have to say. <laughs> they don't care what any photographer has to say. They're going to listen to their friends. And if their friends are saying, you need to go to Dave's studio, they're going to come to Dave's studio. If they're saying, geez, I think I want to go to here, people will follow them. So uh, we, can, we can place all of the ads we want on radio, in the newspaper, things like that, but it really comes from those senior reps talking face-to-face. -face. Do you use radio ads and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's, it's supplementary. And when we do radio ads, I, I don't record myself. I record our high school reps. <laughs> they, they basically talk for me. They say, we had a great experience at Dave's studio, uh, at Cutting Edge Photography, so on and so forth. This is why we should, you, you should go there. And the kids, when they're on the radio, if they hear me, They'll hit to the next station, the button for the next station. If they hear their friend, they'll listen to it and say, oh, that was Chelsea, that was uh, Adrian, that was uh, Lindsay, that was Maria, so on and so forth. Wow. You're actually the first photographer that I've talked to who has actually told me that they use radio advertising. So I'm actually really interested to learn a little bit more about how that works. It, it sounds like to me that it would be something that would be pretty expensive to do and difficult. Any marketing is expensive. <laughs> so if you spend your money wisely, uh, I don't, we don't do just shotgun ads uh, where you just throw it out and let's put an ad. We're very targeted. If it's a senior edition in a newspaper, we'll advertise in that. If it's a, a t around the time of the high school senior, we're going to market around that time, around family portrait time, around that time. So we're not just putting ads on just for the sake of putting ads on. You need to market, but you need to effectively and target your marketing. So you get the biggest bang for your buck. Are there any sort of specific elements that go into an effective radio ad? It, it has to catch their attention. It's got to be short, sweet, something that grabs them. Uh, the attention span of 
the, the listening audience, whether it be high school seniors or even adults, is you got to catch them in the first five or ten seconds. If you don't, it's just blah, 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 blah. It sounds like the teacher on uh, Charlie Brown. Like, here's the blah, 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 blah. And it just goes by and you completely miss it. I've heard horrible radio ads. They'll announce their name only once at the beginning and you never hear who it is halfway through. Or they don't even give you a contact number or where they're located. You know, it's a kind of a neat ad. Oh, that's interesting, but I have no idea who they are or where they're located or how to contact them. You have to have a, a good, solid, quick ad. I don't like one-minute ads. Uh, I like 15-second, maybe 30-second ads, and that's it. I haven't actually even heard any uh, photographers advertising on the radio here in the, the Memphis market. But then again, I, I don't listen to the radio all that much these days. I, I tend to play podcasts and stuff in my car. Right. And, and it's, it's different in your market because you're a larger market than I am. So you have probably 15 stations to choose from. We have four. <laughs> so it's, it's a drastically different when we listen to or target our marketing because we're targeting to the one or two stations the kids are listening to. They have so many more choices in a larger area. So it, it, you have to kind of balance that with where you're located too. And you mentioned newspaper ads too, which is interesting. What would you use in a newspaper ad to capture somebody's attention and create interest? Less words. Uh, people get too wordy with words. They try to put everything about their business in an ad and nobody reads those. you got to catch their attention. Uh, we just had a, a senior ad placed in the the daily or the weekly shopper uh, publication. It's a relatively inexpensive marketing piece, but it, it still costs money. So when we did that, it's bright, it's colorful, oranges, reds, eye-catching. When you look at the page, a lot of muted tones, a lot of black and white, and then there's ours just jumping out at you. It catches people's attention. Very few words, gets to the point, more bullet point type text than anything, and then just get them to call you. Once they call me, I'm in. And so the ad really is essentially saying, hey, we're a high school senior portrait studio. This is what we do. Maybe there's an, an example of a type of image that you create, I'm assuming. Some benefits in, in bullet points and then a call to action that's quite strong with a, with a phone number, essentially. You hit exactly what my ad looks like. It says, Rockstar Senior Portraits, wickedly cool portraits. And then it talks about a little bit about the sessions, multiple locations, multiple changes, no minimums no packages, then our phone number, that's it. And a couple of great images. And the really sort of cool thing about that is that it uses less words, but the words that you are using are very assertive. Exactly. You're not using calls to action that say things like, if you're interested in having a portrait made, maybe you think about possibly calling us today. It's a call now, call today, here's the number. Exactly, we, we worry too much about the features and products that we use such as I use Nikon equipment or professional backdrops or studio lighting. They don't care. They want the end result. It's going to be a fantastic experience. It's wickedly cool portraits. Something that grabs them, it's more emotional. Right. And I'm assuming that you use one of your reps from this year as, a, oh, yeah. as one of the, as the photo in the ad so that the, the other kids recognize that person. Exactly. If we can just recap some of those important elements there, we've got a recognizable, strong image in the ad. We've got mm -hmm. an attention-grabbing headline that isn't just another Me Too headline. It doesn't right. say high school senior portraits. It says wickedly cool rock star seniors or, or something Correct. like that. Then you have a short and concise list of benefits, essentially, and a strong call to action and phone number. Exactly, and color, bright colors. <laughs> it catches people. Bright colors, indeed. Okay, you mentioned reps and, and senior models. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking with people who want to sort of get into this business or they want to expand their, their high school senior market, we talk about ambassadors and reps and, and all that kind of thing. And then they, they come back a little while later and they say, I've tried, I can't get anyone to sign up to my senior ambassador program. It just, you know, I put an ad out there perhaps on Facebook and sent them to somewhere to sign up. I put the page up on the website. They're just having the hardest time getting ambassadors and reps to sign up. So do you have any tips that you can offer to make this a little bit easier for them? Oh, sure. You don't want to be begging people to be a rep. The biggest thing is they have to want to be a rep for you. They have to be clamoring to be a rep for you. Uh, if you're throwing out that call for models, what are you going to get? The person looking for a bargain 
they're not really interested. They're, they're in it for themselves, but not for you. Uh, that's not a rep. That's, an, that's basically you know, an employee or a working agreement. You want somebody that's going to push your business, that's going to promote you, that's going to, every time they talk about you, how great they are. But you have to make it a competition to get to be a rep. And I've got kids that are juniors and sophomores already talking about they would like to be one of my senior models. Those are people that are going to work for you. And the other thing uh, a lot of people make the mistake is they get the reps and then it doesn't really work out. You kind of alluded to that. They're hard, having a hard time acquiring those models or ambassadors. And then I see a lot on the Facebook groups and stuff like that. Oh, but my rep has not done anything. It's, they haven't done anything. What they're doing is they're probably giving away the farm right off the bat. What you did was you've, you've conceded to their desire for something free, and then they have no incentive to do anything afterwards. When I have my uh, reps, they pay for being a rep up front. They pay for their session fee just like a normal person. So if they don't do anything, I've already still have them as a regular client. I haven't given them anything. They have to attain these tiers to receive the products for their referrals. So basically, there's an incentive for them to work. You just don't give things up front. Okay. And is there some kind of a scarcity element to this too, in the sense that maybe you only have a certain number of spaces for reps each year? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's exactly why they're clamoring to be one, because they know I don't give it to everybody. We have smaller school districts in our area. We, I mean, we have class sizes anywhere from 20 to 120. That's our school sizes in here in our area. And I'm, I'm very successful. I have a full-time home-based studio and I'm able to get the majority of the market. So what we do is we limit the number of reps to each school district. So you don't flood that market. I want them to get their referral products. I, I, I'm making it easy for them to get their referral products. If I add too many reps, it dilutes the whole situation and people after a while say, wow, it's just not worth it. So let's let's compare the way that you do this with the way that I've seen other people try to make this work. And let's see if we can highlight the, the main differences here. Mm -hmm. So you have a limited number of reps or ambassadors for each school district each year, whereas a lot of the ones I've seen literally just have sort of an open enrollment for reps. Right. Then you have the fact that they're not automatically getting bonuses or, or anything up front they pay for the session just like anybody else would, but then they're in a rep program where for each person that they refer to you, that, that earns them a certain credit, if you like, towards whatever bonuses or, or products that they're going to get right. as a reward for that. Uh, on the other side of that, other folks that I see are offering benefits up front and saying, okay, so you know, we will pay you money or we'll, we'll give you uh, your session free or a free 16 by 20 print and, and that kind of thing for being a rep or, or for doing so many referrals. But then I also see things like schemes like, well, become a senior rep with me for a chance to win an iPad or some other cool thing. Yeah, we do that too. Yeah. Is that something that, that is a good thing to have, do you think? Yeah, uh, this is the first year we're giving away an iPad mini. And what we do is our, our reps automatically get kind of a ticket in the bucket and every person they refer to, they also get a chance to win it. So it's not just the reps, it's everybody's thrown in the same bucket. But the reps have an incentive to earn more tickets in the bucket by the number of referrals. So again, it's, it's a carrot and incentive for our senior reps. Once you've got them as reps, how do they go about referring you? How, what uh, mechanisms do you have in place that makes it easy for these uh, seniors to send people to you? We get the reps up front well before the season. As it, when they're still a junior, we do a mini session with them. We provide them with mini rep cards, and it has their photo on front, has their class year coming up, and on the back, bring this in for a chance to win an iPad mini. So... Every time somebody brings that card in, I know who made the referral because their face is on the front. They have something to hand out to people, and that provides them with that marketing tool. Yeah, I mean, it's simple. Real simple. That's why it works so well for me. This is a key thing, you know, in, in business that a lot of people try to complicate things because they feel like it should be complicated. Oh, Absolutely. Keep it simple, stupid. I'm all for simple. That's what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it says so right there on my website, you know. Exactly. <laughs>
Let's talk a little bit about social media. Mm -hmm. How does that fit into your overall marketing plan? I mean, you mentioned ads earlier on, and do you do Facebook advertising at all? No, it costs money. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem to work for me. It may work for some, uh, somebody else, but they're fairly expensive for a very low possibility of return. We use a more natural, organic way of interacting with our people on Facebook. We, when we shoot our sessions and the people order, then we post their images on Facebook. We tag that senior. All of their friends see that image. They comment on it, how pretty they look, how good they look. That's awesome. I love this one. And they comment, comment, comment. My watermark is right across the image, so they know exactly who took the photo. That brings business to me. I'm not altogether clear how you can tag people on a Facebook page if they're, if they're not already your personal friend on Facebook. I ask them to be a friend. They, they understand that for me to tag them, they need to be a friend. That's how Facebook is set up. I tell them, once I tag you, you can, do, you can delete me as a friend. It's not going to hurt my feelings. But it gives, and about 90% of the people stay a friend because they want to see their other friends. And they see those things being tagged and everything like that on my business feed. So... It's, it's a very simple thing. Do you mind if I, I'll send a friend request to you. It allows me to tag you. Once I'm done tagging you, if you don't want me to be a friend anymore, just unfriend me. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Kids are okay with that. You gave them no pressure. There's a, a limited opportunity. It gives them the opportunity to be tagged. It's kind of a benefit, benefit, win-win situation. Yeah. And it gets that peer recommendation thing going. Mm -hmm. which is uh, you know, a great moving force in this whole process. Right. A lot of these strategies that we've talked about are working really great for you, but you know, sure. somebody might say, well, that's all well and good, but I'm just starting out. You know, I don't have any real traction yet in this, right. in this marketplace. How would you suggest that somebody gets started when they don't really have any real presence yet? First thing is watch out for giving away the farm. Basically, they'll, I see people three, four years later still, quote unquote, building their portfolio. That's not doing anything for you. So you need to start making money right away. You need to look professional. People will come to you because they see you as a viable option for senior portraiture, not just somebody who's playing photographer, uh, making beer money on the side, as I call it. You need to know how to make money. If you're going to do high school seniors and you want to do it as a business, you need to be a business person. You need to understand the basis of, of business, how much you need to make to be a business, what it all costs you, everything associated with that. Like I said, I'm, I'm running a home-based photography studio full-time, and it's a lot of hard work. I just can't go out and say, let me take pictures of people. And it doesn't work that way. You need to have contacts. You need to make images that stand out so people want to come to them. And then they need to take that and build on that, build that network have those people become their greatest source of referral. Running a business from home, we, we've, you, you know, we've mentioned this a couple of times already, that you, you, know, you run a very successful uh, photography business from, from your home. And when people are starting out, and, you know, that's probably the first thing that they think of is, you know, I, I don't want to go to the expense of renting a, a retail space uh, because clearly that's a huge outlay at the beginning. Right. So they almost default to working from home but i don't think it's very long before they start to realize that whoa <laughs> there's some things they may not have thought out of from the beginning <laughs> <laughs> so you know, can you give us a sort of a rundown of maybe some of the disadvantages if you like or some of the obstacles that some people might have to overcome when they start out a home studio oh sure uh the first thing is the, the legalities i guess of it whether your home it can be is in a zoning district that doesn't allow businesses or you need may need to get a special use permit from the municipality to run a home business uh, depending on that municipality you should check that out you'd hate to be shut down by the municipality it doesn't look good for business ever you need to get attention to yourself you're in a residential district you don't have that traffic flow by that is huge people they don't just drive by your house and say oh yeah i should go get portraits they're, they're going home for lunch, they're going home after work, they're tr trucking the kids off to the soccer field, and they just blast right by you. So getting attention to you, in that, you, you may be off the beaten path. And getting people to, one, to find you, or two, to recognize that you are there is very difficult. So you have to make sure people know who you are and how to find you. 
the other things, I guess you, you need to make your house look professional. You see a lot of people, they walk up to the house and they're like, is this the place to go? There's no signage. Uh, you've got the dog crop circle out in the front yard. It just looks, you know, there's an old car with, up on blocks with the wheels <laughs> off. Yeah, that's somewhere I want to go. <laughs> and then just the logistics of running it from a home. You unfortunately <laughs> impede your home life. You have to separate the props from the toys, and ultimately, you have to make money at it because uh, if you have a significant other, they will eventually get tired of the burden of having people trucking through the home if it's not making money. And they say, you know what, how about we get a real job instead of playing photographer? And that comes on pretty quickly and abruptly, and it creates a lot of conflict for people trying to run it from their home. You don't want that. You want to have a home, a happy home life. Yeah, absolutely. And I would imagine too that if you start out with a business and you decide that you're going to run it from home, mm -hmm. that you need to get the business model right in the sense of where you're positioning yourself in the market, how much you're going to charge. Because I would imagine that trying to run a high volume studio from a, from a home is a lot more difficult than running a low volume, higher priced studio, simply because of the difficulties in traffic. And, you know, you don't want to upset the neighbors because there's a, a, a continual line of cars up and down the street. Exactly. Maybe taking up the neighbor's parking spaces and all this kind of thing. So it, it definitely has an impact on your pricing. Oh, sure. The biggest thing is you need to understand business. Uh, and a lot of photographers come in not understanding business. They think they're going to take pretty pictures and it all kind of falls into place. It doesn't. You have to understand business because you're a photography business. Um, take business classes. Understand cost of goods and marketing and profit, business profits, not just profits. I, because you made $20 on this shoot doesn't mean you made money. You have to understand where all that money goes to insurance, paying the bills, whether you were actually working at Burger King or the engineering company, what was your wage out there versus what you're taking in at home? Does it, it needs to offset. People don't understand that. And they need to make sure they understand that part of things before jumping in to any business. I think understanding the business, you know, the, the fundamental principles of business in the sense that a business runs on money. You, you can't have a business that runs on thin air. Right. It needs money. It needs cash flow. Exactly. It's like the, the blood of the business and the circulation. If, without that, the business is going to suffocate and die. Right. And I think once people really understand that principle, I think it can help to alleviate some of those fears that crop up when people are sitting around trying to come up with their price list. Oh, sure. And I have to look at it from the point of what could I make out of the real world? What do I need to make here? How many people can I realistically attract to my business? How much do I need to make per person on average? And that dictates the pricing structure the products I offer, and the whole business model. So it, it's a backwards, back to front format. You have to look at the end result and then work your way backwards instead of moving forward and saying, now I need to raise my prices or I'm not making enough money. You need to have an idea of the end result first, what the goal is. That's true, you see. And, and, and without that business understanding, what, what happens is, from what I see, is that you'll get someone that doesn't, that doesn't understand that principle and they start at the end and they start working backwards and they end up with, let's say, a, a price list where they, they say, okay, this is what I need to charge for a session. This is what I need to charge for uh, you know, wall portraits and prints and so on. And they look at those prices and it scares the bejesus out of them. <laughs> exactly. Because they immediately react. You know, their, their own sort of fears about money and their insecurities about money kind of just scream and say, I, I wouldn't pay this these prices. Right. <laughs> I, you know, I would not pay these prices. This is uh, how can I expect to ch charge other people? Or maybe I'm not that, you know, I haven't been in the business that long. I'm kind of new. I don't feel like I can charge these things. Uh, I mean, what do you think would help people to m overcome those kind of confusion in the pricing part of their business? Yeah, again, it falls back. You have to understand business. What do I need to make? Uh, and you have to be confident in Am I worth it? If you're not, don't do it. If I'm not capable of selling cars for, and make myself a profit, I don't open up a car dealership, right? Right. So if, if you're not capable of earning a living on photography, you shouldn't be doing it. There is no magic bullet. You see a lot of those, you see a lot on Facebook, the Facebook groups, 
that how to market and you know seniors this and seniors that and there's a lot of people spouting information and you don't know if they're successful or not or if they've they've photographed three seniors last year and made $150 you know that's $450 that's not going to pay for anything and you're taking advice from these two people there's a lot of photographers offering that silver bullet or the one step template get rich now blah 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 it doesn't work that way i'm sorry it's a hard grind people that understand business will give you good information like this zenalog gives great information to people it provides them with solid foundation instead of the magic bullet well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and I know that you do an awful lot too to help people working from home and that kind of thing. And certainly I appreciate you being on here. But there are two things and, and one question. Sure. And, and, and I know that these are two things that we talked about in, in a previous webinar. And I just want to highlight them here today because I know that they have a big impact. The first one is speed and efficiency. Mm-hmm. And I know when we last talked, uh, you made mention of the fact that you purposely do not spend hours and hours chained to your computer editing laboriously all the images that you create for a session. Oh, exactly. You do a basic edit on them. You show relatively finished images because people don't want to see unfinished images. I, I don't care who says this. If you show somebody with blemishes, they are not going to select that. I don't care how you tell them how I'm going to clean that up. If you show them a perfectly photographically, technically perfect image, and then you show no, another one that has flaws in it, but you've edited that, they're going to select the one that's edited 100% of the time. You know, that it's just, that's the way it works. And you have to be efficient about it because every second you spend at your computer is money spent. It's time. I want to watch the Packer game tonight. <laughs> so I'm going to sit back and, I'm, you know, computer goes off. I go do something. I was throwing a football with my son last night. I don't work till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning editing images. I have a family life. You show them the best that you can show them to make the sale, and then you refine from there. Correct. Now, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was this idea of the live view thing that you have going in your studio. Oh, yeah, that's great. And and I know that that is a really cool idea. So for people who weren't on that first webinar... You should listen to it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, the first thing, go listen to that. But can you give us a quick rundown of, of what that is and how it works? Sure. Our live viewing is when I'm working with a high school senior... I've got a controller on my camera. What that does is every time I photograph, it sends an image directly to the iPad and then creates kind of a a gallery of images that they can scroll back and forth through, they can zoom in on, things like that. I have parents having more fun than the kids. Who's spending the money on the session? The parents. Who's buying the images? The parents. If I can entertain them, guess what? I'm already beyond halfway. Uh, It forces me to shoot less. I'm not spraying and praying. I have to compose. I have to light correctly. I have to set up the location, color match, everything like that, because they see everything I shoot. And the best part about it is I keep hearing, oh, my God, that's my favorite. And then you shoot another one. No, no, oh, my gosh, no, no, that's my favorite. Guess what? The kid is starting to perform for me and the parent. The parent is overjoyed. They can't wait to come in and order. Uh, You've built this excitement factor. And it's great because my images go right there. They're seeing it live. They're not walking away from a session saying, gee, I hope everything turned out. They know it turned out. And is that something fairly easy for people to set up? It doesn't require any technical wizardry or anything like that? They have have controllers for Nikon and Canon. They also have third-party uh, I think it's Cam Ranger or something like that. Uh, I use a Nikon controller. It's pretty bulletproof for me. Uh, they have those set up from the majority of cameras. You have to have a port or you have to have some kind of output for it. And then it just built its own little IP address, sends it to the iPad, and bang, you're in business. I can imagine just how effective that is. That's a really cool idea. Oh, yeah. My, mine's a little brick. It's a little block about an inch by inch. By three quarters of an inch, it sits right on the side of my camera. Nobody even notices it. And they're amazed. They think it's magic. But, you know, it, it feeds into the the idea of sowing the seeds for, for a later sale, too. You know, Oh, absolutely. It, it copes with the making that connection and engagement with the parents, as you, as you said. And, and it acts as a sort of a form of positive reinforcement for the senior being photographed. Oh, yeah. They walk away knowing 
They got great images. They can't wait to come in. They're excited. They're Facebooking. They're you know talking about it uh, to their friends at work. And that's just marketing for you. Awesome. Well, uh, I've got one question left, and uh, this, is, this is a question that I like to, to ask most people these days, and, and that is, if you could time travel back to when you first started out, what business advice would you give to yourself? First advice, I'd be better looking. <laughs> better looking people get more business, but uh, short of that, I, I would like to tell myself, you do, you do not need to take every single job especially if they don't pay off. I, I, I took a lot of jobs that Lee spent a lot of time on and it really did never pay off. Once I got rid of those, I, I was able to concentrate on making profits and that's business profits. Okay, not just making, I made $10 above what I sold it for. I need to make business profits. The other thing, it's actually two things. Don't buy stuff that isn't going to make you money. We buy a lot of crap. We buy a lot of blingy things. Don't buy the shiny strap, the cute lens coverings and accessories right off the bat. Those are the rewards of making a profit. When you actually have made money, then you can buy the blingy stuff and the fun stuff. Buy things that only make you money. Focus on making money right off the bat because otherwise you will forever be building that portfolio. You will forever have your significant other looking at you saying, so when are you going to make money? David, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. I could have yes, happily fun. sat here for another hour uh, <laughs> or more uh, talking to you about this, but I know that you're very busy and you have a, a, a very full schedule. And I, I really appreciate you taking time out of that schedule to be here with us today and, and to do it. this. It's always great talking with you. I think uh, you, you're so generous with you know, what you offer to, to photographers, and, and I really appreciate that. No, I appreciate having the opportunity to to help people navigate the muddy waters of being a photographer. People are going to have to listen to this several times, I, I know, because there's an awful lot in here uh, in just 30-odd minutes. I mean, we've really packed a lot of stuff in here. So oh, yeah. thank you so much, and you have a great day. Thank you again, Nigel.